uh, an Africanism, what I'd like to do in the 20-minute uh, period we have is to give you its general outline, its general development, and of course its uh, future path. Uh, some people think that Pan-Africanism is a response to colonialism. While certainly Pan-Africanism responded to colonialism, we must not think that it's colonialism that brought Pan-Africanism into being. Of course, to see this clearly, we should just look at the general evolutionary processes of all societies on a universal basis. All societies have a tendency to go from a smaller social aggregate to a larger social aggregate from the family, to the tribe, to the clan, to the nation, to the continent. This is an evolutionary process. This theory can be seen in living practice if today we were to look at Europe. Europe everywhere speaks of European continental unity. Even though Europe has fought more fratricidal wars than any other continent, or all the continents put together, Europe still speaks of European continental unity. Of course, Africa will unify before Europe, but that's not the point of discussion here this evening. The fact that Europe, with all the fratricidal wars she has fought, can speak of continental unity shows this evolutionary process. Africa, like any other society, anywhere in the world, was involved in this same evolutionary process, going from family to tribe to clan to nation to continent. This evolutionary process was interrupted by European imperialism. It came in two forms, slavery and colonialism. First, they took over 300 million, the strongest, out of Africa, and then they divided Africa at the Berlin Conference. So you can see that Africa herself was moving on this evolutionary process. This evolutionary process, which would lead to continental unity, and Africa will still be the first continent unified, was interrupted by European capitalism. Since it was interrupted by European capitalism, an evolutionary process, the only way that Africa can unite today is through a revolutionary process aiming at a socialist economy. If capitalism destroyed us, it doesn't make sense to use capitalism to continue with it. We must use the anti antithesis of capitalism, which of course is socialism. And certainly if an evolutionary process has been interrupted, the only way we can capture the time lost is through a revolutionary process. We state these facts only to let you know that those of us who are revolutionary, Pan-Africanists, is not because we love revolution. It is historically determined, and we have no alternative but to follow history and to use history for the benefit of our people. So this, then, is the general outlines of Pan-Africanism. So you must not think that Africanism just began. Had Africa been left untrampled by European imperialism, we would have a long time achieved uh, continental unity. Secondly, Pan-Africanism must be seen as a movement, a mass movement. And this mass movement must be properly understood. Africa, of course, because of racism, is belittled everywhere. And many people do not see Africa's constant, constant, underline the word constant, contributions to uh, world civilization. In the, since the 1940s, Africa has given, even before the 1940s, actually, we can go back to the Honorable Marcus Garvey, Africa has given to world political movements a mass character. Africans revolt in masses, never as a vanguard party. If you look at the independence struggle in Africa, it was nothing less than mass. If you look at the struggle in the Caribbean for independence, it was nothing less than mass. And even the United States of America, the only movement they call a mass movement is our movement. Therefore, this mass character must be properly understood. Pan-Africanism has this mass character. Africans have this mass character in responding. And our responsibility is to bring this mass character together make it precise so that it can direct its blows at the enemy, hitting him, hitting him, hitting him until we knock him down. Therefore, the, the task of Pan-Africanism is to gather the masses of our people together in the same organization, irrespective of where they find themselves, be it in Europe, be it in the United States, be it in the Caribbean, or be it in Africa. This is the first aspect then we must understand. Pan-Africanism found its organizational expressions in 1900. Here, a Pan-African conference, here the word conference, was organized by Africans from all over the world. They came together deciding that something must be done for Africa. The, one of the leading organizers of this uh, conference was a man by the name of Henry Sylvester Williams, born in Trinidad, a man whom you should do some history on, a very, very great man. Uh, Doc, Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois attended the conference, but he was not one of the leaders in 1900. By 1917, 1918, uh, the idea of a necessity for a Pan-African uh, Congress, not conference, Congress, was to be called. 
But most of the people who did the conference were dead. Henry Sylvester Williams was dead. A lot of them were dead. Du Bois was about the only one who was alive. Du Bois recognized he had a historic responsibility to continue the work of Pan-Africanism, so he called the first Pan-African Congress. Make a clear distinction. The first one in 1900 was the conference. Du Bois being intelligent, understanding that a conference is limited and a Congress has more elasticity and can go longer, called it a Pan-African Congress. From the 1990s up until 1945, we could say seriously, Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois just about single-handedly kept the flame of Pan-Africanism alive. One thing must also be underlined to you. Pan-Africanism was brought into being in its organized form by the Africans outside of Africa. This was done only because of the oppression of Africa. At that time, Africa was under total colonial domination. There could be no political meetings. As a matter of fact, if you had the paper of the Honorable Marcus Garvey, you could go to jail. So the conditions were such that it was difficult for the Africans on the continent to organize. Africans off of the continent, recognizing this, came quickly to fill up that gap. So Pan-Africanism itself was brought to bear by the diaspora. But you must not think that the diaspora brought Pan-Africanism for the diaspora. Not at all. The center of the discussions has always been Africa. This must be properly understood. Some people try to shift it, make it take it somewhere else, but Africa has always been the focus. Du Bois carried on his uh, congresses up until uh, the fifth congress in 1945. Because of time, we're just going through them uh, quickly. In 1945, saw the uh, fifth Pan-African Congress. Here, you had Africans born on the continent in the Caribbean, and uh, Africans, of course, born uh, in Europe and the United States. At this fifth Pan-African Congress, there were three co-secretaries, of course, W.E.B. Du Bois, George Padmore of Trinidad, and uh, Kwame Nkrumah of Ghana. So he had an African from the Caribbean, one from the United States, and one from the continent, who were co-secretaries of the fifth Pan-African Congress. The fifth Pan-African Congress is crucial for us. A decision was made there. They said that the final confrontation with colonialism is coming. After all, this is 1945, and you must know that there's negative and positives in everything. I remember once as a young man reading Mein Kampf on an airplane, sitting next to a woman. She said, what are you doing? I said, what do you mean what I'm doing? I'm reading uh, Mein Kampf. Why are you reading it? I said, well, Hitler's a very important man. He had historical effects on the world, you know. I'm, she said, well, I'm a Jew. I said, have you read it? She said, no. I said, oh, that's bad. I said, have you not read Sun Yat-sen? She said, no. I said, he says, the first law of war is to know the enemy. If I were a Jew, I would read everything there is to read on Hitler. Yeah, of course. Of course. So, while reading Hitler, she was arguing. I said, well, Hitler had some positive effect anyway. She said, what positive effect did Hitler have? I said, Hitler weakened European imperialism. He weakened the British. He weakened the French. He weakened the Portuguese. He weakened the Belgians. And that's how we got independence. And these are facts of life. Thanks. These are facts of life. When Hitler got through with Britain, when the Indians said they want independence, Britain could do anything but get out the way and let them have independence. As a matter of fact, they got Mahatma Gandhi quick because they didn't want to deal with the armed struggle that the Indians were preparing for British imperialism in India. And by the time India was free, well, it was over. China came up after China, of course, Africa throughout, etc., etc. And by 1960, by 1960, in 15 short years of the declaration of the Fifth Pan-African Congress in 1945, two-thirds of the African continent was independent. You must understand clearly the importance of this. Now, at the Fifth Pan-African Congress, they said the only solution to the final confrontation is mass organization. And I say, if you look at Africans, we have nothing but mass character in our struggles. Of course, this mass character for the moment is spontaneous and must be transformed to something that is planned and permanent. But certainly the mass character is there. If you just look back to the uh, Rodney King situation, those Africans who rebelled, rebelled in mass. They had no planning. That's how backward they were. They didn't think about it. Just on the spot, they said, okay, it's too much. Let's go, let's get them. And everybody said, okay, let's get them. And we rise up as mass and we get them. And then we sit down for 29 years. Of course. Of course. But the mass character is there. And we must understand this uh, mass character. The Fifth Pan-African Congress, most of Africa, of course, was colonized. Kwame Nkrumah came to change all this. By 1958, he threw the British out of Cape Coast and named it Ghana. And Nkrumah declared before the entire world that the independence of Ghana is meaningless unless it's linked with the entire continent of Africa and its unification and liberty. And Ghana and Nkrumah made Ghana the base for every movement that fought against colonialism.